Welcome, everybody. We appreciate your patience. We appreciate all of you being here. We appreciate the love that you give back. So let's start from the top. We're doing this fr straight from Zoom to you today because we're having technical difficulties. Welcome to our 41st episode of Black Dance Stories. Here's a note about why we are here. Our dance world was pummeled by COVID-19 and Black dance artists are finding ways to talk about life during this time. Our world was further turned upside down after horrible events ensued nationally and globally, bringing attention yet again to the need for the Black Lives Matter movement. Black dance artists have not been quiet since. Black dance artists have been doing the work. Black dance artists continue to make work. To stay involved, Black dance artists continue to make work. And to stay involved, we hold these weekly impromptu discussions and tell stories. Black dance stories. This is one action and we will stay involved because we do that. We are a community working together to support, uphold, highlight, and celebrate Black creatives. Tonight is our 41st episode of what we hope will be many Black dance stories told in the artist's own voices. Tonight, it's Rena Butler and Reggie Wilson's turn. Please meet some of our BDS family and I will go first. I am Charmaine Warren. I'm a light-skinned Jamaican. I am the great-granddaughter of Ida Boyd, granddaughter of Solomon Golson and Ruby Chapman, and one of nine children by Theophilus Warren and my 95-year-old mother, Pearlene Warren, who lives in Jamaica. I am the aunt and grand-aunt of 25-plus nieces and nephews at last count. I am a non-disabled Black woman. Now and forever, I promise to acknowledge those who came before me and have toiled to make it possible for me to be present on this land today. Boy, are they working. Today, I give homage to the native people by acknowledging that I live on the stolen land of the indigenous Lenape people, now known as Montclair, New Jersey, with my husband, photographer and graphic artist, Tony Turner. Our daughter, Ashe Turner, a black ballerina with locks, is in her junior year at Boston Conservatory. I have locks that are braided and pulled up into Bantu knots. I'm wearing a white t-shirt and large orange and red hoop earrings. Behind me are photos of our family, a large plant, a lamp, an African mask. Bless you all for your patience. Happy Black Dance Thursday, family. Let's go. I turn it over to Kimani. Hello, everyone. And thank you. Thank you so much for just being with us. Woo. All right. So the importance of acknowledging our familial and dance legacies is an essential tradition. And in keeping with the tradition, I recognize my indigenous brothers and sisters as a first step in moving toward action. With pro profound respect, I honor and acknowledge the Lenape, whose stolen land I am zooming from, currently known as the village of Harlem. I am a black non-disabled woman and I live with my 10 year old son. I am sitting in my dining room surrounded by white walls. I have golden hair with close natural curls. I am wearing a purple sleeveless shirt with sterling silver bodice earrings. I am the granddaughter of Lucille Madison, a wise and giving English professor. I teach because of her. Daughter of Ronald Augustus Fowlin, Jamaican warrior and gourmet chef, and Anne Fowlin, rebel and Renaissance woman. I dance because of them. My son Tamayo keeps me present as I witness this growing boy. I am in awe of his amazing talents and his blossoming spirit. I turn it over to Makada. Hello, hello everyone. Um, my name is Makada Lily and Wabunkozi Margie Rose Roney. I'm in this human experience as an able-bodied Black Indigenous woman. 
pronouns she, her, and they in acknowledgement of my ancestors and my spirit team that is all around me and that is me, also me. I come from a long generational into line of artists and energetic intuitives, um, both of my maternal and paternal lines, the Ro Love Roni lines, which extends out through so many amazing, powerful people, names, and ancestors that I send my love and gratitude to every day, even by just being here. I am the daughter of Nia Love and Antoine Roni, sister of Kojo Roni, Zipporah Roni, and Tequazi Love all of us beautiful, powerful artists. I am Zooming from Harlem, which was respectfully and harmoniously occupied by the unseated Lenape. I am a life, body, and soul alchemist in which I turn ethereal matter into what we call dance, movement, art, poetry, whatever else my soul is called to channel and express love, light, and truth. I'm sitting in my loft room on a love seat. Behind me is a bookshelf, white wall, and hanging macrame. I am wearing a um, tank top that is striped with white and pink. My hair is in two braided ponytails down my shoulders. So community is such a huge part of Black Dance Stories. And we wanna just thank you so much for your patience and coming through on this other link. We wanna know who's watching tonight. So please like this video, drop some comments in the chat, say hello, where you're watching from. Feel free to engage, ask questions, share love. Also, please follow us on our social media. Our Instagram is at Black Dance Stories. Our Twitter is at BLK Dance Stories. Um, and most importantly, please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. We have a huge goal of making it to a thousand subscribers and we're almost there, but we cannot do that without your help and your community. So please subscribe, follow, share with your community. Um, we have a subscriber Sunday, so look out for that on social media and our newsletter, a day where we illuminate our amazing community and encourage more people to be a part of this growing community. We wanna thank everyone for your continual love and support always. Um, and without further ado, everyone grab yourself your cup of happy, which is could be wine, tea, water, um, and let's cheers to Black Dance Stories. Cheers. cheers. Made it. Yes. <laughs> and I pass it to Kimani. So please consider donating so we can keep it going until we don't need to. And we're back live in person. All right. And you know what? I'm going to turn it right over to Charmaine. Thank you, Kimani. And thank you again, folks, for being patient with us. We appreciate all of you. Makeda <laughs> and Kimani are gonna go for a little while and it's going to be me and our fabulous interpreters. And of course, our first guest, Rena. Rena, come on in, Rena. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Patience, right? Oh, patience. So much patience. So much patience. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, cheers. I'm like, oh, all right. wait, wait a minute. Let me see those nails. Wait, do that again. Oh, let me get, because there's one chip on this one. Yep. <laughs> <gasps> okay. Yes. Yes. Cheers. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, well, thanks, Rena. Introduce yourself. I'm here. We're here, and we just want to hear from you. Well, I'm I feel kind of pressured. I mean, those three introductions were so beautiful. I'm like, let me check my notes and make sure I get <laughs> what I need to get. Um, hi everyone. I am Rena Butler. I am zooming in from the indigenous land of the Lenape people. 
uh, Harlem, 121st in Harlem, hey. Um, and I come from the Butler family from the south side of Chicago. Uh, Robin Butler, Richard Butler III. My brother is Richard Butler IV. And my two younger sisters are Raven Butler and Randall Butler. And well, we are wild. <laughs> so <laughs> I come from like a very country kind of family um, where we were just really, there are six of us. So road trips, all of it, camping, everything. They got us out and about and kept us busy, which is why I'm here in front of you today. Um, I am a creator, choreographer, explorer. I love, to, I'm so curious about lots of different things. I'm checking my notes. And I just started painting, speaking of, and I wanted to show. <laughs> I had this wild tsunami dream, which could have been a spiritual marking, um, but it's helping the creativity flow. And it was me and my partner, my fiance, we've been together eight years, Manuel Van Ewell, really wiry French guy that's like David Bowie, <laughs> looks just like David Bowie, so, so wild. Um, and we were standing and we, we travel, we travel a lot, we backpack kind of all over the globe. And we were standing in my dream somewhere in an Asian country, maybe Indonesia, Vietnam or something. And we're talking with friends and I just see this giant tsunami come and no one else sees it. And it doesn't frighten me. It's not dangerous. Anyway, I interpreted it into a painting and it's just me and the tsunami. And maybe this is the spiritual marking, maybe something, but I'm starting to get into it. I have never been to a painting class or anything, so please don't judge me. I don't know much about structure other than what I learned in school about classicism, maybe some pointillism, but that's where we at. We are just trying things to keep the creative juices flowing. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Is that the only one that you did? Uh, there <laughs> Wait, that was a that was a little move right there. Oh, there are. Oh, sorry. Um, no, I I started. What I love about it is it's like there's a little one. This is I don't really know what right side up is, so I'm just gonna show you all the things. But what I love about it is you take the little knife, like the like knife instrument. I don't see. I don't really know what it's called. But you take that little silver metal thing, and you just you can mix colors together and you let it dry. And what I love about it is that you peel back and there are all these layers. And I don't know, I feel like it's synonymous to how I try to project myself or how I just try to be in society, being a black woman. I'm more than just my strong body and my strong voice. I'm vulnerable, multifaceted. There are so many colors to a person basically. And that's what I'm finding with painting is that it could be, you're the creator of your most precious desires and how that unfolds, you don't even know until you just start going and feeling it. All right, so <laughs> dance, desire, painting. Yes. And then your dance life, wait, Respond to that, if, if that is even a question. But I did not expect you to hold up paintings. Everything, everything. I, I think one keeps informing the other. I, I love to surf, I love to travel, um, writing, poetry, choreography. It all informs one of the other things. And it's not that I have a goal with any of them, it's just, I'm playing, I'm exploring. It's just a lot of curiosity. And, you know, I just made 32 a few weekends ago. And I'm, Wait, what? Uh, <laughs> I just made 32 a few weekends ago. Wow. And I'm, I'm feeling, I don't know, you know, they, a lot of women are always like, oh, wow, you're probably in your Saturn returns phase. And I'm still in that, but it feels so creatively abundant right now that I'm just kind of catching wind and letting it kind of gently glide me into different 
different pathways and I'm trying it all and seeing what happens. Do you remember when that choreography bug, if that's the right way to say it happened? Because it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a title, right? Yeah. And I met you before I, I thought. Baby. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so 32. So when did I meet you? You met me at 21. Huh? Yeah, we've known each other that long. When I was a hot mess. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle's company, Kyle really was like, are you going to make rehearsal? Like, where are you? <laughs> and he really so maybe we should back up a little bit for the folks who don't know. You <laughs> dance with, tell them who you dance. Come on now. Okay, okay, okay. Let me let me get myself together. So, how, uh, how, wait, how are you? How's, how is your? Uh, what are those called? Cornrows. Cornrows. Corn no, the the edges. The edges. How are your edges? They're not as laid as I'd like. I should have taken my brush and went a little bit, but it's fine. We're natural. Okay. Um, but <laughs> now you can begin. Okay, now. So I went to the Chicago Academy for the Arts for high school. And then SUNY Purchase, and while at SUNY Purchase, this all ties into, I'm all segueing into Kyle. Um, I studied abroad in Taiwan in, at Taipei National University of the Arts for six months. Probably one of the three black people that I saw in my entire six months in Asia. <laughs> But it was so wild. It was amazing. And it just opened my world. And maybe that's where all of this started flowing. I think the inspiration of traveling. And I got back and I remember we had a master class with Kyle. This was my junior year. And that's when Kyle and I met. And that summer I had to go and work with one of his dancers because she was choreographing my senior rep solo. And she gave me a phrase called Chop Chop from Radio Show. Like I'll never, I still remember the choreography. Boom, leg, dot. And Kyle, I just saw watching. I didn't know who Kyle was. You know, I was like about, I wanted to smoke weed when I was in college and, <laughs> and drink. I, we're real here. <laughs> and, you know, to be a college student. And I didn't really know who I was like, oh yeah, that's cute. Like, hi, I'm Rena. And um, that night he sent me an email and offered me a job with his company. And that was my, yeah, it was 20, 21, I think at that time. And so I was with Kyle. Kyle was so patient with me and just gave me the tools needed to lay the foundation of my career and also encouraged me to choreograph. He saw the work I was making in school and was like, oh, I think you should develop your your choreographic voice I'm like what do you mean like I just made it as a dancer like I think this is enough for me to deal with right now and he's like okay in Miami we have a few days off why don't you go in the studio with Malik Washington and Shalva Montero and just make and I'll come in and I'll critique or offer suggestions and ask questions he's the great world's greatest mentor um, cause he's so in tune and he gives you space to really be yourself. And so it really started there. And then I had little projects here and there with Joffrey Ballet School and whatever school would <laughs> hire a young, like 23, 24 year old, uh, to make work on their students. And that's when I really got familiar with what mentorship could shape up to look like. And I was with Kyle for four and a half years and then transitioned to Bill T. Jones. And right in that transition was dancing part-time, touring part-time with Kyle and dancing full-time with Bill T. Jones. And that job was very challenging, but gave me the thick skin I needed and informed me as an artist, I think. The way, what my style was, what I was really made out of, I think how much I could really take is Bill is a tough and he don't play around. So you really need to come with it. I think more so intellectually. And then how does that align with your physicality, your spirit, all of that for the work that Bill makes. And I could just feel it wasn't the right fit for me probably after my first year in the company, but I didn't end up leaving until after four years in the company. 
you know, you're young, you're 23, 24. And it's like, well, I have a paying job with benefits and, and all of this. And I, I would be stupid living in New York city, not to keep that and honor that. And it was paying well. And I remember Kyle coming to the show and just being like, you know, if you're happy here, stay here. But I think you should try mixing it up a bit. You know, him being a friend and older brother and a mentor all folded into one to really kind of point things out for me and see me with fresh eyes. And so then I auditioned for Hubbard Street and that happened almost immediately. And so I went and danced with Hubbard Street, which is a totally different world from the postmodern situation. I was taking from somatics and rolling on the floor and, you know, getting ready and still, you know, training my body, but not ballet every day. So that was a big shift. I think um, stylistically, also culturally, to be in a room with, in New York, with the past two companies I was standing with were also David Dorfman. I worked with David Dorfman briefly. Um, and my partner, Manuel the Newell, had a collective and, and I was dancing, kind of just sprinkling all over the map. Very postmodern work. And I get to Hubbard Street and everything is very pulled. So, and everything was very white there at the time. You know, it was very, very much a homogenized space. And my coming in, I remember the first day I came with my hair out to here. I was like, hi, like, it's so nice to meet you. And I just remember everyone making a comment about my hair. And I just was like, okay, this is going to be a very different experience for me. And, you know, to deal with the microaggressions, you know, they didn't know the things they know now, or they they know they knew since June of 2020. You know, they didn't really want to pay attention to those things, but it really affected me. And although I grew a lot artistically at Hubbard Street, I was very depressed dancing there because I really didn't have anyone but one other black girl to connect with. And it was just very hard to be othered there. Very, very difficult. But I am glad I had that experience knowing now there's more clarity in advocacy and in my role, my having the platform that I have, there's clarity of how I want to use that and to share that and to hold that with other people and to hold other people up who have experienced something like, I've never been in a creative space that's been predominantly white. I've been fortunate enough to always be around lots of different types of people and traveling to Taiwan, all of that just kind of informed like adaptability and openness, but going to a space like that was incredibly jarring. And thank God, you know, now they've got Linda Denise Fisher Harrell as artistic director, yeah, it's incredible. So, you know, I really, I think they're going to do really well with her and I think it's just going to be amazing and I can't wait to see what she does with that company. Um, but I think my third year, around, I got a call from Nigel Campbell from Give Me. And Nigel was like, so sis, how do you want this contract? And Nigel and I had worked together with Kyle Abraham my first year in the company before Nigel went to Luna Negra and then also uh, Gothenburg in Sweden. And so we kind of shared that downtown dance to, con to like rep company <laughs> transitional period. and. Um, Nigel just, I feel like revived me. I think now I'm back in New York. I was just named choreographic associate, their first ever with the company. And it's just been great. I'm able to really be myself in the space, choreograph on the company, as well as have the space to leave and do the things I need to do and to dance whenever I can, I can with Give Me Company. So it's been a dream really. And to be my black beautiful self in that space and not feel like an alien <laughs> where no one's questioning what my hair is looking like or how that body, that booty be sitting in the trousers that I am dancing in, you know, <laughs> like it is what it is. there's space for me to be me. And it's really, how do we, how are we equitable? 
And so, yeah, that's the journey of me so far. Let's see where we go in the next year, but. But community is strong. Your black community is strong in this, in this journey, right? Totally. And did, did we say that you went to purchase? Yes. We did, you did say that and you said Kyle Abraham, you did say that and you mentioned some other names. I don't want to, you know, okay. make sure. You gotta call it out, exactly. You gotta call it out. <laughs> okay, did you show anybody in Give Me the Artwork? Yes, oh, they, lo they love it. They're like, oh my God. And then we see that, that, that. Yeah, cause it's been a new, it's like a new marking for me. And I think instead of, you know, quarantine, it was a lot of, catching up on shows and watching things and your eyes get so tired and I really wanted to find another creative outlet that would unlock pockets of self and I think that that's what painting does for me it's this really kind of unveiling truth and ugly truths I'm like oh my god oh my gosh she's there and you can see within even the habits of the stroking and I think it's similar to choreography it's like the habits that we have in creating or the things we fall back on, there's a challenge there to then try something new. I think I'm really into this surrealist technique where I'm swirling colors and I wanna try something different because I don't wanna, you know, I don't want to be a monolithic create, creator. I want to be able to split it, decompart, ah, I'm trying to use big words and it's not going out because I had a few mine. <laughs> You know, I want to deconstruct. I want to decolonize like things I've been knowing and things that are so familiar to me. What is it like to just unravel and try something else and to innovate self? Wow. Yeah. You sound like, listen to me, I'm shaking my head as if I know anything about making work. I don't, but I'm hearing you say these things and connecting them to your painting and then connecting them to choreography. And I would, I cannot wait to see when you build that set. <gasps> oh, wait, I didn't even think about, okay, Charmaine, you're giving me ideas. We need to write that down. <laughs> need to write it down. And, and, oh, here's a big question. Oh, it just came to me. Yeah. When you go back and look at your old work, could you paint it? Let me write that down as well. Okay. I even thought about that. Yeah, not at all. I cringe watching my old work. <laughs> Do you really? But, you know, the choices, because also I think there's something to when you're still dancing full time and then creating in tandem. Like at Hubbard Street, I remember making work one hour and then going into the in Ohad's Ohad Naharin choreography rehearsal or Crystal Pite or Kyle or whoever was on the bill. And it's so difficult to separate yourself from one hour to the next of how would I do it? I'm so in this muscle memory of doing a port abroad this way from informed by this choreographer yeah. that I think I was trying different ideas that didn't feel like my own. And so now I, I'm really mindful of, okay, this is a, I gotta take this brain off, get this one, put it back in, and now it's me, you know? I'm not gonna be Reggie Wilson and start asking you, I don't even know if he's gonna ask you that, but I remember when I was dancing for David Rousseff and he wouldn't go to shows. Yeah, I do the same. Yeah. That's a long time ago when we used to go to shows, right? That's a whole other story. But you got to take it off and put it over there. So true. I mean, I will say I watch my masters a lot. Kyle, my Shifu, who is just like forever someone that I watch and learn from because he's so insightful um, in the worlds he creates on stage and still edgy and... Not that I'm, I have to do exactly what that is, but I take cues from my master and I'm just like, wow, okay, subtlety is a big thing. And I'll write down words, subtlety, and then forget what I saw with Kyle, but remember the feeling it gave me watching an image move just so slightly or how he moves 
energy or what momentum of energy looks like on stage. So I'll watch it in a way that is, um, yeah, that helps me to grow as uh, his student essentially or his, his mentee. And I know he's gonna hit me with hard questions. Like he's mentoring, he's my mentor for the Give Me title as well. It just makes the most sense because he knows me the best, I think, out of anyone I would ask. And I know he'll be like, mm, sis, why do we why do we really need that part? Like editing, editing, editing. <laughs> you know? Oh, community, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, there's somebody that is not subtle that is gonna come on. <laughs> Uh-oh, uh-oh. Reggie Wilson, Reggie Wilson, Reggie. calling Reggie Wilson, please. Calling, calling Reggie Wilson. See, look, see, look. Sink entry. He's not even on camera. <laughs> look, look. <laughs> oh, that was really subtle, Reggie. I'm gonna give you that. That was cute. I don't think it was subtle. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get not my. Even Come on, sip that tea. What's the tea? Wait. Can you say hello to me first? Hi. <laughs> Cheers me. Cheers me, Reggie Wilson. Cheers. Cheers. How you doing? Uh-uh. I'm all right. You all right? How's everybody? <laughs> but I'm here. I'm going to leave. Oh. You two have a little time together. Rena, he is not subtle. That's I am so subtle. <laughs> Goodbye. See you in a little bit. Yes. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm- Why do you look so scared? <laughs> no, I'm excited. I'm excited. Ah, yeah. I, I saved my excitement for later, and I thought I wouldn't do that on camera. I really, it's hitting me, maybe because I haven't eaten in a few hours, but. Eating, it's a little warm. It's a little kind of nervous. You don't know who's really looking at you. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you said a couple things that were kind of really interesting and wonderful, but I don't want to come in. Oh, so you use this word mentor, and I've talked to a number of folks about that term. Because I feel like when I was coming up, it's not to say I didn't have mentors and continue to have mentors. I just don't call them that or think of them like that. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna put you on the spot before I put myself on the spot. Can you talk a little bit more about how you think about that relationship? I mean, do you think of it as a hierarchy? Do you think of it as, um, like how? Wait, yeah. Like how- <laughs> How do you think about it? Actually, I like that. I think it's how do we intersect? It's really, it's this transaction, this exchange that feels very much like allowing each other room to, and I keep using inform, but that's the best word I can come up with right now. But I do feel like it's allowing each other the room to be ourselves, to hear each other out, to say, to have a dialogue where it's not like, okay, I'll do what you tell me. (laughs) I don't ever feel like it's like that. It's, it's the question. I feel like I'm prompted by my mentors and as a mentor myself, like I prompt these questions of what is it that you want to do? Okay. Here are a few things I know that can guide you in that direction. Um, it's really how I can be a support for someone also. As a mentor, sometimes I feel like I'm here gassing them up, like just come up, come up, come up. You know, it, it looks different for each mentee I have and I don't have so many, but I, speaking as a mentor and as a mentee, um, I'd like that, ideally that's the relationship I have with Kyle and that's the relationship I'd like, yeah. And did that come out of like, because I think you're talking now for the Gibney, it's a formal relationship, right? Like it's a, it's a formal, like it's an agreement, right? Whereas your experience before wasn't, so when you, I feel like it, what am I trying to say? I feel like it kind of came into the dance world 
as kind of this policy from above that people wanted um, choreographers to learn how to edit, make shorter pieces, get to the point <laughs> kind of situation. And I feel like the folks in my head who either I've mentored formally or that I've been mentored by informally where it's just like sometimes just those conversations with other choreographers without necessarily thinking of um, it being a formal mentor mentee relationship, you know, where somebody just told me about how, you know, hold on to your checkbook or, you know, make sure you get that check before you leave that presenter so and so. You know, like choreographers, we don't have as much opportunities to share that information that presenters necessarily have at all the conferences because we're always trying to get our work out there. Um, so I, I was just thinking like folks that I uh, continue to be in relationship with after long periods of time. And when I came to New York in 1985 and they're still making work and I still get to run into them or invite them to something or hear them talk like how rich that exchange is. And sometimes when I've been forced to, because sometimes it's a, it's a gig or it's a, um, part of a set of money or something where you need a mentor to kind of be in that situation. And it's just like, okay, well, I know that person's eye. And I know when they say that, somebody else might hear in another way. I don't have to take it's like I did that when I was in university with them or I did that when I was in their company. I just, it's just like, oh, their eye or their ear. Do you have other, um, and then I, I would love a question or two from you, so I'm not just questioning you. I, I, um, do you have mentors that aren't uh, choreographers? Yeah, definitely. Toni Morrison, it's, this is gonna be a weird answer, but Toni Morrison's, um, Oh my God, I was just the source of self-regard. Her collection of essays is a mentor for me. Mm -hmm. I, I love, I use it a lot of source material. I was just saying yesterday, I was in another panel discussion and talking about Plato's allegory of the cave is a mentor that uh, philosophy of the ignorant being in a cave. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what the truth is until we actually shed light on that. I think that is a sort of mentorship for me, just that philosophy itself. I think of mentorship also as inspiration. So like using that collection of essays of Toni Morrison, is if I get stuck, I'm like, ah, let me dive back in and see what, what other layers I can find within maybe this chapter or this essay that she's written. Um, so informative for me. I think I really love philosophies, source material in that way. And Kyle, it feels more like a, it's so informal, which is why I chose him because a mentor, I'm like, I could always use fresh eyes, but what we gonna, you know? <laughs> I, I, it also feels like, I love that you bring this up because I think people, especially organizations are like, well, we need to, classify you as an emerging artist and it's like what is an emerging artist these days and why can't it just be yeah exactly we're always constantly I think of it like Janet Jackson she always has she re-emerges with every album it's a new look it could be piercings it could be a gothic phase that she's going through and so we're always emerging and I almost feel like organizations might look at mentorship like babysitting like you were saying, like with the editing and the things like that and what Kyle and I establish, he's over in London just premiering with a piece on the Royal Ballet. So, you know, I'm like, let me not bother him. Let me just do my thing. And when I feel ready for his opinion or his suggestions, I reach out and it's so chill in that way. I, I, was, I didn't think I was gonna find a place to insert this and I don't know if it'll be seen, but when you talk about reinventing yourself and um, can people see it? Is that you on the? No, it's not me at all. People will never see it. It's not gonna show up right there. I see it. It's Grace Jones and oh, Naomi Campbell. 
And Grace Jones is like thrusting cake on her chest. So it's not just like, let them eat cake, but it's like, let them eat cake off of me. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love it. Queen. So just the thought of like um, Janet Jackson reinventing herself, the fact that Grace is still around and reinventing herself and um, yeah, anyway, so. No, I love that. And that's such a beautiful reminder whenever we do feel like, well, why do I need a this or a that to babysit my work? That reemergence is something to kind of tether myself or my thoughts to. Like, well, maybe you need it for this version of you. I love, I love people. I love um, needing somebody to babysit me, but I don't always like to think that it's um, somebody that knows more. Sometimes it's somebody that actually knows less about dance or choreography, or maybe it's somebody from a completely different context or completely different structure of what choreography is or what movement is or what dance is supposed to look like. That um, I feel like I get a lot from, is Charmaine popping back in here? <laughs> He's not subtle. He's there's nothing subtle about you, it's, Reggie it's, it's, Wilson. Um, it's so sad. It's just so. It's so sad. You can't, <laughs> I can't hide anything. Can't hide it. I will okay. say. Finish what you were gonna say. I will say, like Reggie, even you paving the way for people like me. <laughs> Let me finish. That is mentorship in itself. Like, okay, I know you were just talking about like something completely other than dance, like helping and shaping, but it's also predecessors or people that have tried far out things that have made it accessible and inspirational for me. So I honor you. Thank you. That worked. Now let me stop. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Before you, you go, talk, Rena. We got to talk about the Midwest and what they now call the Mid-South and our families coming from there. And I, I wanted to get to that. Don't stop shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> wait, pause that. You're going to come back to that. I promise. But don't go yet, Rena. <laughs> Reggie, so your Tande said. Uh oh, no. No. <laughs> no. Stop it. No. I'm going to do the read. Let me finish. He said you were his reluctant mentor. (laughs) (laughs) See? See? You can't get away from it. Okay. So here's some some people are here. Ann Davison, Grace, Emile Lenoir, Liliana Hammonds, John Finkelstein is here. Kenneth Prado is here, Maxine Montalas, Kayla Dodler, Pooja Vassan, Henry Lee, Janice Brenner is here, Jamal Barnes is here, Wendy Perrin is here, Monica Hill, Carlos Torres, Stephanie Tuman, I told you, Yotande, and Joe Melillo is here. What? What? Hi, people. <laughs> say hi, say hi, say hi. Stephanie was my gram teacher at Purchase. She, ah, yes, okay. thinking of you always and being grounded always. Wait, wait, I think we need to do that again. One, two, three, both of you. One, two, three, get it, Reggie. Yes, honey, all from the pelvis. Oh, ah. Stephanie Tuman was, I'm trying to think about, because I think about Fist and Heel as like, not classes, but groups, like there have been different groups that were more around each other's time. And then Stephanie, Stephanie would have been in the second iteration, I think, of Fist and Heel. And Stephanie, because Janine, Beverly, Beverly Prentice Ryan and um, Nadine Mose were like in my first concert concert. Wait, was Stephanie? Stephanie was in that concert too, in a trio with um, um, with uh, Terry Hollis, the late Terry Hollis 
and um, um, I can't remember, I'm horrible at name, but Stephanie introduced me to Paul who, and brought Paul Hamilton into the company, the other Jamaican, who is um, um, still in the company. And can dance his butt off, come on. Yeah. I'm trying to think that Stephanie, I know Stephanie. Wait, you can't do any more company. Wait, wait, hold on. Rena, wow. see you in a hot second. Oh. I know, I know. Her coming back because you got to talk, what is it, Chicago? Well, yeah. we'll see. Well. Because Milwaukee is like a suburb of Chicago. So it's a... <laughs> Boo, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> Reggie Wilson. Yes, ma'am. Introduce yourself, and I know it's T, but. It's T, um, hi. Hi, darling. Clink, clink. Uh, my name's Reggie Wilson. I'm artistic director of Reggie Wilson Fist, and I would put my heel up, but it's got a hole in the sock. <laughs> um, Fist and Heel Performance Group, um, Brooklyn, New York-based dance company. Um, I guess originally, Historically, traditionally, Muncie, Lenny Lenape land. Um, I'm originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My family, as far back as we can trace, is from Mississippi Delta. And before that, um, we don't know, and that's on both sides. And what my father's side is from Mississippi, my mom's side is from Arkansas. And I've been saying that, as you know, Charmaine, since 1996 in a piece called Introduction. So, and, when and you promise you're going to teach me. I said that if this whole format, that ain't the format, I, it had to be the format that it would be an oh. open rehearsal where I would teach you because I've never, because it's really just about me. And, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, so I get, I shouldn't look at my phone while I'm on here. <laughs> no. Not yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Sorry, Whitney. Um, and people don't know who Whitney is, and I'm only no. But yes, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. Um, so we, a while ago, but back to what we were talking about, which is me, which everybody thinks I would just want to keep talking about me, me, me. But I'm tired of talking about me, me. Let's me. go back to Stephanie then. Let's go and, back and, to Stephanie. Well, Stephanie um, is that purchase? I still think Stephanie and I aren't in like constant communication at all. Um, I know that she is still in touch with a number of people that I see every once in a while, Yantande. Um, I think Paul sees her every once in a while. But, um, and I made a big solo on Stephanie. I forget what year that was, called Sea Lion Omen. Um, and it was, um, it, I guess that was in my um, Black Bausch period. <laughs> or, um, you know, Tom's theater, so it was more like a theater kind of, I think I was inspired by, I think some of the work that uh, Ron Brown back then, mm -hmm. uh, Ronald K. Brown um, and um, David, with David. Yeah, Rousseff. Theatrical, um, expressive, emotional, um, just like epic pieces. My, I mean, the solo for Stephanie was only maybe about 30 minutes or so. Um, but then I'm trying to think how did I think I'm, try, I'm trying to connect why I connect Stephanie and Whitney together so much. But um, they dance together because um, is he no, he's not telling me. You how. danced in your company too? Who? Yatande. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why did no, I know that? So wait, so wait, 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 wait. So listen, um, Whitney Yantande, mm -hmm. sorry if I'm not supposed to say that, but um, Yantande and um, Jamal and I all lived together for, I forget how long it was, but that was the best roommate situation. And because we would, somebody was always gone. So you have <laughs> an apartment, it was a three bedroom. So somebody would always kind of have the place primarily to themselves, but when we all got together, it was just like this wonderful, oh my God, what's up? You know, and we'd be cooking and talking and um, yeah, that was, when was that? That was in the 90s. It had to be in the 90s, it had mm -hmm. to be in the 90s. 
And then Paul. <laughs> yeah, Is he texting you? Trying to get him to come online. And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> but um, I love it. Call him and ask him. So, and then, you know. uh, yeah, because Jamal was in Bill T, just like the whole community, just like how it just like connects. And that that's the thing to me about dance history that always kind of evaporates or doesn't get maintained that I really hope these dance stories also maintain and surface, you know, it's just like all the stuff that seems to be invisibilized and where people have traveled to and who's lived where and who danced with who back when. And so I'm rambling now. I, I, no. I have nothing else to say, Charmaine. No, I think you should, I don't think you're rambling, but I think you should talk about the people because you're talking about traveling and the people, Retta. So Retta, oh. Retta was good friends with Nadine Mose, I call it good friends, and she came to rehearsal and she threatened me. Wait, wait. Is Nadine from Jamaica? No, 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 no. Nadine is from Trinidad. Well, same thing. Well, not really, but same. But not really. But uh, Nadine is from Trinidad. Retta did theater in Trinidad and she came to rehearsal and she threatened me and said, you're going to have to use big women in your work one day. <laughs> Wait, did she have her hands on her hips? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> she Retta just, has been with you. She just looked me straight in the face and said, you know, one day you're going to have to use a big girl in your work. Oh. And I thought about it and I was just like, of course. And then I did. And then she's been there ever since. So that was maybe 90, that was, that was again, the early nineties. And so, and then Lawrence, who's been in the company since then, they both came on um, to do vocal work. Lawrence Harding uh, from Sierra Leone came into the work in the like 92, 93, we did, a, um, Maybe it was just after that, because Edessa, Edessa Weeks was in my company. Um, I knew that. I did know that. Back from a long time ago. So Edessa, mm -hmm. um, mother, rest her soul, um, from yeah. Uganda. And um, so it's always, I mean, it's always been an international group of Black folks. Um, yeah. So I'm just trying to think who else. I'm, I'm sure I'm always leaving somebody out. But then... Um, who left and work, came back? I think it was in the work until I think either 2000 or 2002 or somewhere around there. Paul came in and Paul's been with the company since 1999. He's from Jamaica. Whitney came in and out. Uh, Yontande came in and out and... Um, was we had for a while there was a this idea that I had to call um company members at large which <laughs> had nothing to do with what Retta was talking about but just this fact that it wasn't like a full-time company yeah. and it was per project and some projects might take me two years might take me yeah. five years and people kind of connected or were able to do it for that period of time and then they might go away do something else and then they would come back in and so it really has been like um family Raja, Raja also. Raja is one of the newer, that's a newer, 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 newer batch of folks that came in in the, I was going to say the late, I guess the late knots. So 2000 something. Raja 13, was a late one? Oh. 13. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Raja was only with me for maybe two of our performances. But he also acted as a Raja Feather Kelly came in and he, I was looking for a company manager. So he came in and did company management, mm -hmm. dance in the company and did graphic um, design and continues to work with Fist and Heel as a graphic design. I don't know where he finds the time to do it. Sometimes <laughs> he doesn't. <laughs> but um, um, who all, like the people in the company now are kind of wonderful, kind of just Aww. a I feel like it's a great group of people. Uh, Clement Mensa from, um, well, from Amsterdam, well, Netherlands, but he was originally, or is originally from Ghana. And, um, oh, Michel Kwaku mm -hmm. from Ivory Coast. He came in and he was another one that threatened me. 
Wait, was was Michelle who left Michelle and came back? Michelle him in Dakar at Tubab Jalal in Senegal and Mama Germain's, um, at Mama Germain's um, school, grounds, kingdom. And um, I'd gotten, where did I, oh, that was, I had gotten a Guggenheim. So I was there on my own money, on my own dime doing research. And um, Gassira, you know Gassira? Yes. Gassira used to be with Urban Bushwoman who had the Kai Fetch Festival. I knew her from New York when she worked at Arts International. And so I got hooked up with her. She introduced me to Mama Germain. And I was just hanging out, watching class and stuff. And Mama Germain's like, oh, you want to teach a workshop? I was like, yeah, sure, I'll teach a workshop. So I taught a workshop. And after it, um, Michelle came up to me and he said, I will be dancing in your company. <laughs> and I was just like, I, I don't know how, because I don't really, I just finished like this huge project with a group from Zimbabwe and a group from Trinidad. There was like this multi-year project, a lot of money from different places. And um, I didn't, I just couldn't imagine trying to figure out the logistics and the funds and the paperwork yeah. of getting a dancer in West Africa to move to New York for my little pickup dance company, you know, with this much money to offer people on a regular basis. And I, I just smiled and said, oh, thank you. <laughs> I was going to say, what did you say? You just said, thank you. I said, thank you. And then, I mean, it's like, you know, you're at um, Tubab, you're at um, Le Col de Sable in Tubab July. So it's not like I just finished the class and walked away because you're right. there. And so I was kind of hanging out and stuff like that and got to, and then um, I don't even know if it was a year later, it might've been two years later, I got an email saying I'm in New York. <laughs> and it was from Michelle and I was actually had just, um, um, I call it lost a dancer, but a dancer wasn't able to do a performance that we were having at um, Fall for Dance. And um, I was teaching for Summer Melt, movement research. And um, I said, Michelle, why don't you, it's like, <laughs> welcome to America. Um, Cause he had been to Europe and then he'd been to Japan and then he was in the States. And I was just like, well, why don't you come like be my guest for this class that I'm teaching. And he came, took the class. So two days later, I was just like, dude, you want to dance with us at uh, mm -hmm. City Center? And then he was with me, worked with me for quite a little chunk of time, learned a lot of the rep. And then he moved on, went to, I call it, not, it wasn't David's company, he ended up working with David Rousseff and went out to UCLA to get his degree. Yeah. And um, he said, and then he came back and now he's back in the company again. Of course, <laughs> of course. So, and I saw him in Boston. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And he was so, freshly back, right? He'd been back maybe about a year then. Mm. Yeah, but we had stayed in touch and stuff. But um, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm thinking, and who are the, the I, I call them the handsome women of Fist and Heel right now, who are like this amazing <gasps> group. Um, uh, Annie Wong, Hadar mm -hmm. Ahuvia, Michelle Yard, and Gabriela Silva. Um, Gabby is from Brazil, and Annie was born in Beijing, China, and um, 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 Hadar was born in Argentina but grew up in Israel, Israel Palestine, and Florida, and Hadar was recommended by Anna Schoen, who worked with me for a long oh, time. Yeah. Uh, you remember little short Anna, who, when we were talking about little, like really <laughs> fabulous, and she went oh. on, she danced with us for about 10 years, and um, Anna went on to get her master's, I think it was her master's in genetic counseling, and has two kids now, and became more orthodox, um, and more observant than she had been before because that was something we were always, always navigating. Yeah. And then she recommended Hadar. And then Annie and Gabby took a workshop that I took 
was teaching down in residency workshopping. I was teaching down in um, in Florida at um, is it the ACA? I forget the name of it. But um, they all like, it was really weird. They like paid to take a workshop. Reggie, <laughs> Reggie, like, has um, anybody auditioned in that word audition for the company? I don't have auditions. Right? I don't have auditions and um, sometimes, you know, sometimes there's close, you get close to auditions, but it's really more, it's mutual to me about how people, like if they have the bandwidth, if they have the interest, mm -hmm. if they can, I would always sit folks down and say, can you afford to dance with Fist and Heel? Because it didn't have, I didn't, we still don't have like a guaranteed period of, um, you know, there's no guaranteed contract. Um, we work when people can work. So it's a very kind of fluid, mutual kind of like, um, I usually sit, have tea. Like I've either heard about them or they've heard about me. They might take a workshop. They might threaten me. You know, I might threaten them. <laughs> I, wait, does that we really work? Other. We track each other. So Clement, the one uh, from Netherlands. Clement was a student of mine, by the way. And he was recommended by, because he was at the um, Ailey Fordham. Yes, my student. Yes. And so he was at a Sawiks student who was a former Fist and Heel, but we still were colleagues. And she thought, oh, Clement might be good. And I was looking for some volunteers to dance with this thing that I did with Andrea Wamba from, um, from Senegal, but he's Congolese, was looking to, um, to, um, get some dancers to do this piece on the steps of the, um, um, I forget the name of the building. It's now the home of the American um, Indian, the museum there, oh, the exchange. It's on down in Wall Street, down by, you know, near the bull, you know, with the bull with the little, yeah. it's down there. Anyway, I was looking for some volunteers to dance with the company because we want, it was an outdoor site specific piece and we wanted more bodies. And um, he came in, he came in, I think, for a day and a half, two days. And then he got into, um, I think he got into, he worked with Elisa Monte or Ronald K. Brown. I think it was Elisa Monte first. And then Ron. And then, so he got that, like, gig, gig. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of stayed in touch. I ran into him in the park. And then, like, did some, he, um, where was that? That was, you remember, is it Summer Stages? I guess it's too packed. I haven't been there forever now. Really? But um, No, no, Bri not Brian, not Brian Park. The one yeah, with the know, water. The park, you know, when they have the big concert. Yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah. Summer Stage, yeah. Summer yeah. Stage, and it was some African concert, and we saw each other, we were running towards each other, and we kind of kept in touch. And then he danced with me. I feel like he did a project or two, and then he went off to London to get his master's. At the um, at the Laban. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he went on, and then I called him up just before I was just like, "Dude, what you doing? What's up? I need a dancer. Are you around?" He's just like, "Oh, I'm actually supposed to be coming back to America in like whatever like the exact perfect time." Yeah. Came back, started working again, and he's been with Fist and Heel for how long? I don't know. I'm really bad. I put at you on the spot. Yeah, it's since that, I mean, it was, I think our first encounter was probably around 2002. And so that's, that's the Fist and Hill member at large kind of <laughs> idea. Just because you can't do a performance or a project doesn't mean that you're not part of the family or part of um, my thinking about what might be another project. Um, we only have about a few minutes and I don't want to not mention this because I walked away from St. Mark's Church feeling sanctified after seeing that piece. Oh. And why am I not remembering the entire name of the piece? Because it was very oh, long. Too long. All my titles, except unless they're too short and then they're weird. Um, yes. They stood shaking while others began to shout. Okay, so I guess I was shouting, maybe. And then you took it to Philly and that was another version. But now there's a film. So say something about that before oh, we finish talking. There, so I curated a platform 
for Judy Hussey Taylor at Dance Space. And that was called, um, I can't remember the name of that. That was another long title. I know, yes. Um, Dancing Platform, Praying Grounds, Blackness Churches, and Downtown Dance. Wow, you and, remembered. Well, once I got going, once, <laughs> once it starts going, and then, um, wait, what was I saying? What was, um, but I was saying that now it's a film. You curated the oh, platform. Well, I was trying to get to that. So it was this platform, <laughs> and it was, I, so I was also commissioned to make a piece for my own platform, and that was, <laughs> thinking about the history of St. Mark's Church as being like one of the oldest kind of religious continual use sites. So it was Native American, then Peter Stuyvesant, and then the church, and then Isidore Duncan was banned from like performing there. And then like thinking about dance space and the poetry project. And the um, balcony was rumored by Allen Ginsberg to be a slave gallery, meaning that's where the slaves or enslaved folks were forced to sit. And um, so doing some of that research and then we kind of wanted to see, Judy had wanted to see about moving her platform idea to another city. They had a relationship with some folks in Philadelphia. So anyway, the platform moved to Philadelphia. I was able to do, they stood shaking while others began to shout at the Church of the Advocate thinking about its history, about the Black Panthers having their meetings there, about the first seven Episcopal um, female priests being ordained there, the first black female bishop in the Episcopal Church being ordained at this church, um, the, what's going on in the community, the culture. So anyway, it, it's, it's all just kind of moving around and I don't know. But, but, oh, I almost said, but damn, and it's a church, but whatever, but God, okay, Rena, come back. It's time. Rina, 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 Rina. Wait, Reggie. Oh, she's I back. I know you said Let more money, see. but Rina's here. You're going to sing. Come on, Reggie. One. Nope. Rina going to sing. Rina going to sing. Exactly. <laughs> Y'all, stop me. This, okay, thank you, Reggie. <laughs> You're on glass number one. <laughs> no, I love everything. She said, stop me. <laughs> she said, stop me. Re Re Reg oh gosh, I can't even talk. And say, I love everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there are people watching and we're gonna calm down and be serious. Really? No. No, I thought, no, no chanting, Reggie, not even a half a chant. <laughs> you, saw, you saw what he just said, he went up. I gave you a full Baptist, <laughs> how are you? So, um. Okay, go ahead to Chicago without you giving well, me no, some I Baptist something. Hubbard Street, because coming from Milwaukee back in 1985, and going and do being part of the chair program at Northwestern, um, Hubbard Street was like this thing, right? Hubbard Street, but it was it was a jazz company then. Yeah. But then they kind of changed over, and I know Ohad came and said, or they had a couple of Ohad's pieces there. And Ohad is somebody who I danced with like for two yeah. to thirty seconds back in he eighteen. He did. 1873, 1874, when he had his New York company. Yeah. So did you actually get to engage with him or was it with the, um, the Gagaist? It's so funny. I'm so glad actually you brought this up because you know he has such an infamous reputation depending on who you ask. And when his Gagaist, his repetitors came, it was so funny because the two black women in the company were always in the back and on the side. And it was like very clear that they just weren't seeing it for us. And it was like, okay, cool. Like, I feel like they're really trying to achieve something. We don't really know. We really know, but you know, I'm like, let me just have fun because it doesn't make any sense for me in the time in that phase to like, 
be like, why are we in the back? Why are we on the side? You know, because I could have gone there. I'm from the South side, but they I did put you in the back. They put me in the back and on the side for every section. So Ohad came in the last week. It was our tech week. And we had been working with these two stagers for like maybe two months or three months before then. Mm. And I was stuffing my face with grapes in the green room. I mean, I'm always in the green room (laughs) because I didn't have any features. I was just doing the ensemble stuff in the back and on the side. And Ohad is like, hello. I'm like, oh, hi, grapes in my cheeks. And he was like, I really enjoy watching you dance and my eye keeps going to you, but it's a pity that I don't really see much of you. And I'm like, well, you know, the people you sent here did a great job of, you know, lies, 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 lies. You did a great job <laughs> of, of putting this the show together. And I'm happy just to be dancing your work. It's a first for me. And I don't think I picked up on the principles until maybe later. And the whole week went by. It was the day of the premiere. He comes back and everybody's like waiting for his feedback. And Ohad was like, it was okay. Um, I have notes. I'll let everybody know. Thanks for your time and your efforts. It was so simple. I get a call late that night from Jonathan Alsberry, who was the, one of the rehearsal directors at the time. He was like, girl. I said, what? He's like, you better get your black ass to this theater. <laughs> Four hours before call to learn the final solo of the evening length piece, Decadence. <laughs> He said, he was like, it was a screaming match backstage. This is all of JoJo's account. And JoJo was saying, Ohad was like, I just don't understand. Like my eye goes to the black girl, not because she's black, but because she's doing the work correctly. And we need her perspective in the the evening and we, we miss it. Give her this. Well, that's already been cast and there's like a, 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 a second cast and a third cast there. I don't care. You give it to Rena. No one covers her. I said, oh, oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. So it was such a gift he left. And then, you know, we were virtual because he couldn't fly back to Chicago, but then we, it was virtual because he just wanted to see and help. He's like, I know I gave this to you last minute, but I just want to check in and, and coach a little bit. That was an amazing gift. I have never had an experience like that. And I had felt, I was like, this doesn't seem equitable. Like this is weird. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, being black in a homogenized space is like, I know what's really happening here. And maybe you're overlooking it or you really know what you're doing and how you're designing the space. But from the creator himself to come in and, and say that and do that, that was just awesome. So yeah, Ohad is a real one. <laughs> and I just was really <laughs> Makeda and Kimani are back because we're so late. But Reggie, does that sound like the real? Does that sound like Ohad to you? Ohad, anything would sound like Ohad. Oh. <laughs> anything would sound like Ohad, and um, he's kind of in you know in my dance emotional. Self, if you want to for a moment, I can start to tear up. <laughs> like, so I was at NYU. Oh boy. <laughs> which had a similar demographic, kind of as you just talked about Hubbard Street back in the um back in 1985 to 88. And um Craig, Craig Patterson. Oh Craig Patterson, Bopi. Was, had left Ohad to dance with Mark Morris when Mark Morris was going over to Belgium and Ohad needed a new dancer. Ohad had come into um, NYU to set a piece and Larry Rhodes, rest his soul, and Ohad were close and Larry didn't, they didn't like dancers to start working before they had graduated. I get a special dispensation, Mari, Ohad's wife from the Ailey, who was married and working with him. Me up in the, I started rehearsing with Mari and then Megan Williams and um, 
Ani Udovitsky and a whole set of other folks that are still kind. Anyway, Ohad, and then like I was in one or two performances of Ohad. We did a little bit of touring. And then Ohad got invited back to um, Israel to take over Batsheva. And he invited himself, Mari, and me. So I was going to get my little graduated, newly dancing in New York, kind of moved to Israel. I was like, it's a three hour drive to Egypt. <laughs> yes. Completely oblivious to any and all politics, right? I'll drive to Egypt. <laughs> and then I had a major knee injury and yeah. my dance career kind of stopped right there. And Ohad was always super supportive and um, we would stay in touch. And then a few, I call it a few years ago, it was maybe 2010, I had the opportunity to go to Israel through some other kind of project. And oh. um, I sent Ohad an email late at night, I guess it was early this morning. I was like, Ohad, I'm coming to um, Israel, we'll be in uh, Jerusalem and uh, give me a call, here's my number. He called me up like, Minutes later, it's just like, oh, you'll come to Tel Aviv. You'll have, we'll show you everything and you'll teach a class and you can take company class, whatever you, I was like, yeah, but the project I'm going in is supposed to be in Jerusalem. He was just like, oh, there's nothing in Jerusalem. <laughs> I was like, and so all the conflict that I had in my early career and like that, if I had have moved to Israel with Ohad, being part of Bat Sheva, like what, that would have done to me versus me having my knees and the universe saying no. And that was the start of me going back to Milwaukee and doing research about what was the church I grew up in and then going down south to the Delta to find out what that was about. And then looking for that kind of Protestant Christian kind of thing ended up in Trinidad, then went to Zimbabwe and then kind of like that whole thing. And then in the end, I finally did that trip. I went to Israel to reconnect with, um, Mm. And got to reconnect with Ohad. I took a trip to Egypt and got to explore. That's how, because I hadn't really been to, well, I had been to East Africa, but to been to East North Africa, to be in Egypt and think about it as this thing and start problematizing, like, how does Egypt always get excised out of Africa? And then the, um, the Moses's project was really kind of like grounded mm. in thinking about um, this idea of Moses and leadership. And um, what did you, Charmaine, what did you say, Yantan, they call me like a reluctant yes. mentor? Oh my gosh, Reggie, I was just about to come in and say a reluctant like a, mentor. A reluctant leader is just yes. like, you know, so it's just interesting about, and I'm thinking about all the folks who were, all the black folks who were making work in New York when I came in that just, had laid this like door open for me. So Jowale, um, B.B. Miller, Blondell, um, Ralph, uh, David Rusev, Ron, Marlise Yearby, um, Lady Gord Sangoma. Um, who else was around then? Um, the, um, um, the singers, the singers, Dr. Bernice uh, Riggs, Sweet yeah, Honey in the Rock. Sweet Honey, oh my gosh. Um, all, and, nobody, and Bill T, and nobody's Bill T. work was the same. Nope nobody's work was the same. And I was like, I can be myself. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. That was a different time. Wait, so Reggie, first of all, we have to go because we started late oh, and no, people, are, people are still here, including bye, Gloria bye, Pritchard. Bye, Charmaine. Stop it. <laughs> you're not, you're, you're going to make me cuss. You're not subtle. Reggie, Laurie is here. Laurie Pritchard is here. Yay, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Rena, <laughs> Rena, he oh, just wait. no. I got to Lori, you Pritchard was on the panel, was on the panel at DTW for Fresh Tracks. That was on the panel that selected me from that got me my first professional performance in New York. Come on, Lori, Fresh Tracks. Come on, Lori, and she's always been one of those people. So that's that mentor. Yeah. Yeah. relationship where it's just yep. like mentorship but it's just like kind of framed as like colleague friend community community yeah. like i have an issue i have a problem or i can't figure out or i don't understand yeah. 
being able to have more than one entity that you can yeah. go to. Yeah. It, it's happy abundance. Yeah. Rena, list off a couple of names. I know you said Kyle, list off a couple of names because we got to we got to go. No. <laughs> Kyle, the novel, the collection of essays, uh, the source of self-regard, Plato's allegory of the cave. Anything, I'm a big French film 1960s fan, Truffaut. I like to look at how he kind of originated like the jump cuts. So I've been kind of sourcing just to see who the filmographers have been dated back to the 1950s, 60s, just to see what I'm doing right now with my own dance films. Um, <sighs> my family, because they will rip all of my artwork to shreds. Um, and I really need that. They will be like, girl, you always do the most. Like, can't you just have this one girl on the one part? My sister is always very opinionated. But they are my mentors in a way because they don't know anything about dance. But they, they don't care nothing about it either. They, <laughs> they know what hits them. And that's what's real. And I'm trying to reach real people. Um, oh, my God, Reggie, I have so many questions for you. OK, like, wait. If y'all don't know, we have a Patreon account and you subscribe and you can hear more. Subscribe to our Patreon. Look at me talking right into the camera. And you can hear more because they're going to talk for a little bit more. So I'm going to pass it on. They say that what? What Patre kind of account? Patreon. Okay. I don't know anything about that. I told you. You told people, me, but I don't know how you spell it and how to look for it. It's in the chat, right? Okay. Look at me, look at me, look at me, it, right, right. Is it in the chat? It is. Yeah, it's Great. in the chat, Patreon. Thank, thank you, Reggie. Come on. And I'm going to turn it over to Makeda, and then I'm going to take it back, and then we're going to say to ta Thank you. Um, so thank you, everyone, who is here tonight and just being with us through the technical difficulties and changes. Um, <laughs> We, I just want to remind everyone to like and comment on the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on our social media so we can grow, grow, grow this community, beautiful community. Also a huge thanks to our co-presenting partner, uh, 651 Arts for helping to make Black Dance Stories continue to happen. You can check all the wonderful things that they are doing on their social media. Their Instagram is at 651 Arts. Um, so next week, the next week's artists are, <laughs> what are y'all laughing at? Adia. And the picture up with Grace Jones and, and oh. eat cake <laughs> off of me. <laughs> I'm looking at my notes, but okay. Next week's artists are Adia, Tamar Whitaker, and Nija Whitson. So Yay! Stay Thursday evening, and we'll see you next week. Yes. And passing it to you, Thanks, Maki. Thank you, everybody. Y'all are the bomb, the bomb diggity. Reggie Wilson, hallelujah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bo, for helping us through tonight. Good night, everybody. Hallelujah. Cheers. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Reggie. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> so sorry. I cannot be professional right now. <laughs> Reggie, why? <laughs>